to the sermon today, let us pray. Holy Heavenly Father, we come before you to hear your words of wisdom. We pray that you would open our hearts and that your Holy Spirit would guide us into all truth. We ask this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. So today's sermon is about spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare. I had someone call me the other day during the week and they felt like they were under spiritual attack. And so I started to pray with them and talk to them about what was going on in their lives. And so uh, apparently the husband was dealing with some addiction problems. And as she was praying for him, she felt like she was under attack. And, and so she called me and I prayed with her. And I said, you know, I thought I was thinking about it after that call. And it's like, well, you know, I haven't really preached on spiritual warfare. And so today we're going to look at that. And so I hope today uh, to offer some advice on this spiritual battle that we all face. <clears throat> you know, one thing I love is to watch Animal Planet. I love watching Animal Planet. In fact, I love going to the zoo. The zoo is an amazing thing because there are places that you can go see these animals that you would never see. Because I don't plan on going to Africa. Who knows where I'll end up in my life. But I, you know, I would have never got the opportunity to see a lion without uh, going to a zoo. Or I love penguins. Penguins are the silliest creatures God created. They're just so neat. And he, he built a little suit that they wear. You know, they have a little tuxedo, a uh, natural tuxedo. There's just all kinds of neat things that God created. And so I love watching Animal Planet and the Nature Channel and seeing all the wonders that God created. Now, they are wonderful, and, and animals are neat, and God created them perfect and, and just created them with such, oh, uniqueness. And it's just a wonder when you watch Animal Planet and see this bug that can shoot. There's one bug that spits plasma at a velocity that's greater than the speed of sound. I was watching that and I was like, wow, that's amazing. God is neat. God is interesting. But one thing about Animal Planet is, is that when we look at the circle of life, like the Lion King told us, uh, it's not as great as you think. In fact, the real world is brutal. The real world is kind of, uh, I'm trying to find a nice word for it, but it's the circle of life. And so... The predators feed on the prey and the prey feeds on the grass. And so you see uh, these lions taking down gazelle. You see the crocodiles getting whatever comes near the water source. And it's kind of very brutal but necessary. Because the lions got to eat just like the gazelles got to eat and the crocodiles got to eat. But one thing that's interesting about lions, when you look at them, they... Uh, the, they, they set traps for their prey. It's really interesting. And so you'll have a lion, the male lion, he'll be on one end of the field of a gazelle, and on the other end, the lioness is set up. And right in the middle are the gazelle. And so what will happen is, is the lion will run up on them, and he'll roar really loudly. And this scares the gazelles to start running the opposite direction right into the lionesses. And so the, tra the trap is sprung. And so what do they do? They look for the, the one that's kind of running outside the pack. The one that's kind of alone. And then they isolate it. And then they take it down. And that gazelle becomes dinner for that pride of lions. Well, what does this have to do with spiritual warfare? You know, Peter describes the devil... Like a roaring lion. Peter describes the devil like a roaring lion in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. He says, Be sober minded and alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in your faith and in the knowledge that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of suffering. Amen. Amen. And so the devil is like a lion that's prowling around looking for someone to devour. And so 
he uses these same old tricks, just like on Animal Planet, where they isolate someone that's kind of outside the stream. They don't have a foundation, a family. They don't have a church home. And he isolates them even further. And then once they're isolated, he begins to work on them, filling their heart with despair, guilt, shame. And he begins to work even harder on them until he finally brings them down. That's the same old tricks that he's used throughout all the centuries. Isolate and then take them down. And he uses guilt and he uses shame to do it. And so uh, there's a lot of folks who today say, well, I don't need the church. I can read the Bible at home. I can pray at home. And I always ask them when I hear someone say that, do you pray at home? Do you read the Bible at home? And the answer is most likely no. They just say this in their heart. They say this in their mind so that they feel comfortable enough not to have to come to church. But because they're isolated, they're weak prey for the devil. Because they don't have a foundation, they don't have a prayer group that they can rely on to defend against the schemes of the devil. And so the devil, using his same old tricks, telling people, well, you don't need the church. You can find your spiritual sight within. Look within. Don't look to the divine. Look within. All the answers are within you. Because you're like God. The same line he told to Eve and Adam in the garden. The de Jesus told us about the devil in John chapter 8, verse 44. He tells us, as he's speaking to these Pharisees who blaspheme the Holy Spirit, the sin that will not be forgiven. All sin, all type of sin will be forgiven, man. Uh, sexual immorality, uh, lying, stealing. Killing All sin will be forgiven man, except for one. And that is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And these folks blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Because how do you blaspheme the Holy Spirit? Well, Jesus, through the work of the Holy Spirit, heals the sick, feeds the hungry, raises the dead, opens the eyes of the blind, heals the lame and the deaf. And they said it was the work of Satan that was doing it. Well, that won't be forgiven. To deceive people to say that Satan is doing that work of God. And that will not be forgiven. And so he says this. He says in John chapter 8 verse 44. You belong to your father the devil. You want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. Not holding to the truth. For there is no truth in him when he lies. He speaks his native language for he is a liar. For the father of lies. And so we know that the devil is this great deceiver. He's a liar. And then John chapter 10, he continues to follow this up. He says in verse 9 through 10, he says, I am the gate. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief, the devil, comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they have it in the fullness. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Amen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. And so he's a liar from the beginning, a murderer who only comes to steal, kill and destroy. That's his only objective is to come and to kill, steal and destroy, to cause chaos. In our lives, the devil prowls around looking for a crack in our marriage, a crack in a relationship, something that we struggle with, and he tries to exploit it by causing division and all of these things. These are the same things that the devil has used throughout all of history. First, if we're going to fight a spiritual battle, we have to recognize first that we're in a battle. And that we have an adversary. In fact, the word Satan means adversary in Aramaic and Hebrew. It means adversary. The adversary of us. The adversary of God. And so we have an enemy who seeks to kill, steal, and destroy the things that we have. So who is this adversary? 
Well, the scriptures give us just a tidbit of what's going on. And so I will look at a few of them. Ezekiel and Isaiah just have a few descriptions of this entity known as the devil, Satan. Ezekiel 28, 12-17 says, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every kind of precious stone adorned you. Ruby, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, uh, jasper sapphire, turquoise, and emeralds. Your mountings and settings were crafted in gold, prepared on the day of your creation. Catch that? He's a created being. Not like Christ, as John 1.1 1, 1 tells us, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so the Word was always Jesus Christ. And from His... He had no beginning. He existed before time Began. And here we have a created being. Your mountings and settings crafted in gold prepared on the day of your creation. He's a created thing just as we are. You were anointed as a guardian cherubim. For I had ordained, uh, ordained you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked among the fiery stones. From the day you were created. Created. You were blameless in your ways until wickedness was found in you by the vastness of your trade. That's the way someone speaks. You trade lies, the way you deal with people. He deceitfully dealt with people. You were filled with violence and you sinned. So I drove you in disgrace from the mountain of God and I banished you, O guardian cherubim, from among the fiery stones. Your heart grew proud of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. Amen. And so here we have this, cre this entity that was a guardian cherubim who in his vanity became haughty in his heart. He created violence and he did murder and he did deceit. And he was driven from the mountain of God. Isaiah 14 expands on this a little bit. Isaiah 14, 12 through 17. He says, How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cut down to the ground, O destroyer of nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. There's the key. He wants to desires to be greater than God. And that's blasphemy. He desires to raise His throne above all the angels, the stars of God, and above God. He says this, He says, I will sit on the mount of assembly, basically the seat of God, in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. He's going to be, he wants to become a God, is what He's saying. But you will be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. Those who see you will stare and they will ponder your fate. Is this the man who shook the earth and made the kingdoms tremble, who turned the world into a desert and destroyed its cities, who refused to let, refused to let the captives return to their home? Amen. And so what basically he finishes up and says, you said in your heart, you want to be God. You want to raise above the Most High. You want to sit in the seat of God. Your pride and your vanity have corrupted you. And in that corruption, you have done deceit, lies, and murder. And because of this, you were cast down to the pit. And your ultimate end, as he tells us here in verse 16 through 17, is, is that when we are recreated in the image of Christ, when we put, uh, we shed these mortal coils, these mortal bodies, and we put on the immortal, the uh, imperishable, we become like Christ, we will look upon this creature and pity him. Because we'll say, this was the one that shook the nation? This was the one that everyone was afraid of? This one that called the adversary of God? He was the one? In fact, we will look at him and so, uh, so 
We have an adversary. We've looked at it a little bit. This person who is so deceived, uh, deceived by their own desire for power and lust for praise to be worshipped as a god. This thing that has become so corrupted. And so in its corruption, he desires to destroy the things of God and the people of God. And so we're in a spiritual battle. But I want to tell you that the, the apostles, the disciples of Jesus told us this, James 4, 7. Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. If you submit yourself to God and the things of God, and you resist the devil, James says, the apostle James the half-brother of Jesus says he will flee from you. He will flee from you. 1 John chapter 4, 4 says, Every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, which is already in the world at this time. You little children are from God and have overcome them because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Amen. I want you to tell this to yourself. If you find yourself under spiritual attack, under demonic attack, you feel like you're being stopped from accomplishing what God has told you that He wants you to do, realize that greater is He who is in you than He who is in the world. I'm telling you that the Holy Spirit of God the Holy Spirit of God that is with you and in you is greater than he who is in the world. The Spirit of God that hovered over the foundations of the waters of this earth. When this earth was formed, he hovered over the waters. We find that in Genesis. That same power that created life is, is you have access to. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. The apostles weren't immune to these attacks. In fact, we see in uh, 2 Corinthians, Paul being attacked by this messenger of Satan. In fact, we don't know exactly what it was, but uh, the, ancients, uh, the, the ancient forefathers of the church would say that he would come under these attacks, uh, these insane headaches that were just so debilitating. That he lifted it up to God and he asked God, to deliver him from it. And God gave him a complete answer and said, My grace is sufficient for you to overcome this. In fact, Barnabas and Paul, when they wanted to go to Macedonia, Satan tried to buffet their way. Satan tried to buffet their way and not let them go to Macedonia. So God told them, redirect, go here for now, and I'll prepare uh, Macedonia for when it's ready for you to go. In fact, we see in the book of Daniel, when Daniel prayed to the Lord for an answer, the, uh, the, the, the angel Gabriel comes to him and says, I'm sorry we're late. We were going to answer your prayer three weeks ago, but we ran into demonic forces and we had to do battle with them. And so we were at a stalemate with these forces. So we called Michael, the archangel, and he took care of it. It's over with. Now I can come and give you the answer that you prayed for. And so we see this attack, these demonic attacks in the Bible on the people of God. But James and Paul and Peter says that if we will remain sober minded, if we will continue to submit ourselves to God and resist the devil, he'll flee from us. Because greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. And so we come to our principal verse. Paul describing the fight that we're in. He says, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can make your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this world's darkness, and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. 
Therefore, take up full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you will be able to stand your ground. And having done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness arrayed, and with your feet fitted with the readiness of the gospel of peace. And in addition to all of this, take up your shield of faith, which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Amen. Amen. Notice this. The shield of faith can block any arrow uh, shot from the demonic forces, from the satanic forces, the adversarial forces of God and our enemy. The shield of faith will protect you. Your faith in Christ has protected you. And then guess what? You have a spiritual weapon He gives you here. He calls it the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Which is the Word of God. It's the sword of the Spirit. In fact, Jesus gives us the perfect example of using the sword of the Spirit. Jesus fasts for 40 days, then He goes into the desert to be tempted. And the devil shows up at His weakest moment. That's just like the devil. To show up at our worst and weakest moment. To cause us to stumble, to fall, to sin, whatever. And yet, God has given us a way. He says, get back up. Dust yourself off. If you've stumbled, confess to me and I'll forgive you. And so the devil has no more power over the children of God. But Jesus gives us this perfect example of what he does. When the devil shows up to tempt him in the desert, to cause him to stumble... Does he use his powers to dissuade the devil? No. He uses the Word of God. In fact, Jesus quotes Deuteronomy three times. The devil says to Jesus, Well, if you are the Son of God, turn, these bread, uh, turn this stone into bread and feed yourself. And Jesus qu quoted Deuteronomy chapter 8. Verse 3 says, Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. He said, well, the devil thought about it for a minute. And guess what the devil does? He quotes Psalm 91. The devil quotes Psalm 91, verse 11 through 12, to try to convince him with the word of God. And he says, well, if you are the son of God, he takes them to the temple. So they're translated, they're transported to the temple. And they're on top of the temple. And he says, according to Psalm 91, if you jump from the temple, if you are the Son of God, your feet will not strike a stone. Because God's angels will immediately appear and bear you up. So Jesus, knowing the Word of God, because He is the Word of God. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16 you shall not tempt the Lord your God. So then the devil tries and he shows him all the kings of the kingdoms of the world. He shows him all the riches and all these things. And he says, it would all be yours if you bow down and worship me. Jesus again goes back to the word of God using that sword of the spirit, the word of God. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 13. It is written... Worship the Lord your God and your God alone. Away from you, Satan. And at that time, the devil left and angels came and ministered to him. And so Jesus giving us this amazing example of how to use the Word of God to defend ourselves against the demonic attacks in our lives. That means that we have to know the Word of God because the devil knows the Word of God. But we have to get into it. We have to know it if we want to use it for all of our benefit. The second spiritual weapons. There are two spiritual weapons. First is the Word of God, which Paul calls the Spirit or the Sword of the Spirit. The second is prayer. Prayer has wrought more things in this world than we will ever know. It's brought nations up. It's cast nations down. It's stopped floods. It has done more things than we could ever imagine. Prayer is powerful. Especially when God's people pray, God hears them. 
and he acts. And so, especially the prayer of faith. Jesus prayed in the garden when he was tempted. When Satan wanted to toss Peter like wheat. In fact, he goes to Peter and Peter has a big mouth. And he says, Peter, Satan wanted to toss you. He's been petitioning God to be able to toss you like wheat. But don't worry, Peter. I prayed for you. And you're going to be all right. Prayer. Again, Jesus showing us the example of prayer, using it to its full effect as our spiritual weapon. I remember uh, listening to this uh, testimony by these missionaries that had went down to South America during the Civil War down there. And they were bringing antibiotics and medicines to, there, I think there was a cholera outbreak and uh, some other type of outbreak that was happening during the Civil War. And so they were bringing medicine in there, and God bless those missionaries. Well, the gorillas the, that were in the jungle, as they were trekking through, they had made camp because they had one more day of hiking before they got to the village that they were going, were watching them in the jungle. They were watching them closely. And for some reason, across the world, in America, someone's mother, a mother of those missionaries, woke up in the middle of the night. She called all the parents of those missionaries. She called her churches. She called everyone, woke them up in the middle of the night and said, I don't know what is happening, but something bad's about to happen. Everyone start praying. And they started praying. Well, these missionaries woke up the next morning, made their hike to the village, and a man came up, a local with an AK-47, walked up to him and said, where are the soldiers that were with you? He said, what soldiers? What are you talking about? It's just us four missionaries. He said, no, 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 no. Where are the soldiers that were with you? He said, I don't know what you're talking about. He said, okay, they're around here somewhere, I bet. You know, we were going to rob y'all last night. We were going to kill y'all and take your stuff. But you had all those armed guards that surrounded you all night long. You had all those... And they didn't go to sleep. All night long they watched over you and paced back and forth, armed to the teeth. He said, I don't know what you're talking about. So he called his mama. And his mama said, well, what time did that happen? At? And he told him, and of course it was the exact same time. Everyone got up and they started praying. God intervened in that situation because faithful believers went to their knees in prayer. And he supernaturally, I guess, caused a vision in their eyes to see these armed guards and it wouldn't be wise for them to attack them. And it saved their lives. And so prayer is a spiritual weapon that we can use when we're under spiritual attack from the enemy. When he comes for our children to deceive them and lead them astray. When he comes for our marriages and tries to break us up. We use the Word of God and we use prayer. And we can overcome just as Jesus We can resist and He will flee from us. Jesus giving us the perfect example of spiritual warfare. He came to show us how to live, how to be. To follow His example. Of course, He had the power at His disposal. And he could have just cast Satan away like nothing. But he came to show us how to live even under adversity, even under persecution, even under obstacles, even the forces of the unseen realms when they come against us. By faith, by the word of God, and by prayer, we overcome. Amen. The book of Revelations, one of my favorite passages says, they overcame the devil by faith and the word of their testimony, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They overcame the devil. And so I want to encourage you today that greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm excited to... Uh,